Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Hey everyone, real quickly here before we dive into this episode, I want to talk about e-scouting. Now, if you're listening to this show, I got nothing but love for you. Um, And if I didn't truly believe something was going to drastically improve your odds of becoming a better hunter, I wouldn't even bring it up. I recently took an e-scouting course called Treeline Pursuits. Now, if you haven't heard of Mark Livesey, he is pretty much the best in the world when it comes to e-scouting. He's developed an online educational tool that not only combines his extensive knowledge of successful elk hunts, uh, but his massive knowledge in e-scouting. What he's done is he's put a course together that's going to teach you e-scouting techniques and strategies, how to find and identify elk holding features, how to evaluate zones of pressure and trail usage, determining limitations and hunt parameters, researching and developing hunt areas, planning travel and hunt routes, identifying and testing glassing spots, glassing strategies, formulating a a strategic hunt plan, maximizing the full potential of your mobile hunting apps, effectively utilizing prime hunting hours. Now, this course is designed to help improve your odds of killing an elk. But what I plan to do is take the knowledge I've learned in this course and apply it to other hunts that I plan on taking this year or or in the future, you know, mule deer, bear, moose, whatever it is you're going to be after, you're going to be able to use these tools and and take them in and apply them to your hunt. It's only going to make you a better hunter. It's going to cut your boots on the ground time down. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm still a huge proponent of boots on the ground, but, uh, you know, go check it out, folks. Believe me, it's worth it. And, uh, you know, because Mark, he loves us Canadians so much, he gave us a promo code to save a bet. Use the promo code FOCUS22 at checkout, and you're going to get 20 US dollars off. Um, So great deal, guys. Check it out. And as always, guys, uh, make sure you subscribe give us a five star rating uh pete and i we really appreciate all that well this sucks you head down when you were tuesday you went down you got yourself a new setup Yeah, so I left Tuesday at noon. I got to Oregon, or I got to the bow rack at 8 o'clock. We recorded a podcast till 10. Went to the hotel, did cardio, slept, woke up, did cardio again. Went back to the bow rack. Still got you? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. It just, my kids are fucking with the (laughs) webcam, and now it doesn't work. It's all good, man. (laughs) I should have pulled out, dude. (laughs) <laughs> shouldn't we have all um i did a number of times but it was it was just that that's the thing man you just need to not uh, do it once I let it or three three times and that's it wow that's i I'm, I'm a one and done kind of guy man i was yeah like, oh yeah we didn't have my first kid until i was 37 and so you know by the time we were like kind of thinking like yeah i could do this again i was like nah fuck that i'm done yeah, i want my yeah. life back because i was like 40 and i'm like i want to do shit you know <clears throat> anyways yeah. And then went back to the bow rack the next morning for like 1030 and just sat there. It took three hours, I guess, because I was back on the road by 2 p.m. And I, it could have been a little bit quicker, but you're kind of just hanging out. You know what I mean? Like, it's pretty rad there. So I wasn't not like, you know, I was in a rush. Yeah, and then, yeah, no left with a brand new rig, man. Everything, new sights, stabilizer, bow, strings, all of it. You went with the Hoyt RX-7. Ultra, I did, which was not what I thought I was going to do. I was 90% sure I was getting the V3X33. Oh, yeah. What's, yeah. Your, what's the axle to axle on that Ultra? It's 34, and the true oh, nice. axle to axle is an inch longer. It's almost an inch, an inch and a half longer than the V3X33, and I think yeah. that's why I, it felt better because I was kind of struggling with the peep on the on the Matthews like I just couldn't lie I could like it was still very nice and it fit good but dude 
I've never had the benefit of sitting there and shooting like multiple bows and just seeing which ones felt good. And there was something about that RX-7 Ultra. It was perfect. Like literally, I would come to full draw and I would put my nose down on the string and the peep and the sight were perfectly lined up every single time. Like it was just bam, like it was just there. And none of the other bows that I shot because like, I'm going to be honest with you, man, the draw cycles are so smooth. Oh, They're yeah. so dead in the hand. Like there's no functional difference between a flagship Matthews and a flagship Hoyt. Like they're, and I even shot the flagship prime and he, like, I'm like, I don't know, man. But the only thing that really stuck out to me was how perfectly fitting the bow was to me. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. I think it's because I'm six one, I got a 30 inch draw length. And I think the string angle on the longer axle to axle bow just fit me better for whatever yeah. reason. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty cool, man. I'd love to be able to do that. Just go and just shoot a bunch of bows. Like I, I we have a local archery shop here. And I'm pretty tight with those guys. They Is that hardcore? Go. Yeah. How are they? I've heard good things, man. Yeah, they're good. I mean, I, I'm pretty tight with them, right? So I go down there. Let, they let me fuck around a bit here and there, but uh, yep. Yeah, I, this year I got the I got the I was I'm, I dude I was always a math or Hoyt guy always. Yeah. And then this year I went to Matthews. Yeah, I don't blame you. It's a, it's a phenomenal like they're killing it, and they're by far the most popular bow right now. Like that yeah. V3X is is outselling it's that ev- bridge everything. lock system. Insane. Yeah, the bridge lock is nice. Well, see, the nice thing is about the Hoyt is it's got the Picatinny rail know. attachment, so you're kind of same and and then with the inline rest, I'm kind of in the same spot. Oh yeah. Um, but it, I do think that bridge lock is is a beautiful setup, and they did have more sights for it than they had with uh the picket they were out of the picatinny rail attachments for everything except black gold and option which yeah, is I fine think, because i think it's gonna but next year i think it'll catch up so 100 are, are you a new bow every year type of guy never this is only the second bow i've ever owned oh yeah how long have you been shooting a bow for four years oh yeah nice nice yeah i bought a pro defiant 34 oh it was my first bow ever nice and uh uh, yeah, man. I, now, here's the funny thing. I haven't been a bow every year guy, but moving forward, I might be like a bow every <laughs> every other year guy. And yeah. that's actually one of the reasons, one of the things I did differently is I, 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 my, my Pro Defiant is an 80-pound bow. And I only got 70-pound limbs on the Ultra for two reasons. One, I'm 43 and 80 pounds, I can feel it in my shoulder. Like sometimes you want to practice for a while. And with the 80 pounds, you just can't, man. Like after you mm-hmm. f- fucking sling 50 arrows at 80 pounds, it's like, nah, you're done. Or you got to wait 10 minutes between ends to like let the inflammation come down a little bit. And I wanted something that would be easy to sell. And I think 70 pounds these days is just way easier to sell than, than 80 pounds. So, and from what I understand... The technology has come so fast. I bet you I'm getting pretty close to the same speed. And I've got it overclocked to about 74 pounds. So I bet you I'm getting pretty close to the similar speeds of a, a 74 pound RX-7 Ultra and an 80 or 81 pound Pro Defiant 34. Yeah. Last year I shot the 80. I shot the RX-5 80. Yeah. The year before I shot the RX-470. Yeah. Now I'm shooting the Matthews uh, 70. Yep. All the same shit, man. And you got a long draw length, so you're going to pick up arrow speed just on your long yeah. draw length. So that's the other with thing. arrow setups now, like, fuck, man. And the biggest thing is it's, it's shot placement. Like, right. Yes. What are you doing for arrow? So, site, what'd you, you went with what site? So, black gold pro site five pin slider. Oh, yeah. How do you like that? So far, it's amazing. And, and it was kind of funny. That was one of the things because I've only, my sight on my old bow is a, a tr- an Axel AccuTouch five-pin yeah. slider, which I really liked. I liked the customizability of the Axels, but they some things do slide around a little bit. Like you'd get home from a from a week in the bush, and your third axis was all wonky or something. Mm-hmm. Like there was just a couple things that didn't bite, and I'm pretty rough on my shit. And so I did know going in, I didn't want to run another Excel. And plus, you know, like with the podcast and stuff, part of my job is 
is to like test different stuff. And I thought, yeah. so I was, I knew going in, I was either going to run a black gold or a spot hog. And I thought what I was going to run was one of those, the dual track black golds or the triple stack, um, spot hogs, you know, the ones that have the multiple pins, but they're vertical. Yeah. yeah. And they seem to be all the rage these days. And I guess the, the philosophy is like less thing in your vision, but I got to say, I get really nervous not having five pins. Like I love the fact that no matter what happens, something can walk in range in between 20 and 60. I don't got to touch anything. I don't got to move anything and I can just pick a pin and shoot. And that's happened to me like multiple times where I, you know, I'm in an elk situation or a deer situation and I'm ranging stuff between 30 and 50. And I'm like, I don't know where he's going to come in. He's going to come in somewhere between 30 and 50. And then he comes in and, I just get nervous that I would have to reach down and maybe I would forget to reset it. So when we really started looking at sites, I'm like, fuck it. I just feel comfortable with the five pin slider. I'm sticking with it. And I've never felt like my, I don't find it complicated and I don't find it clouds up my, my site picture. Like I, I'm very comfortable. So I, I like that. Yeah. I, I stick with the five pin. It's uh, I shot adjustable sliders for f- fixed pins and uh I don't know. I just, I shoot a five pin and my, I just first pins 30 yards. So I go 30 to 70. And you, do, so do you shoot that fixed Matthews on yours? Yeah. But I got, uh, I got the XL in there. Five okay. Pin. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just, uh, the, the, the one it came with was good. It was a five pin. It just, it's pretty tight to the riser. Oh, okay. So, and that's made by Excel. Those Matthew sites are Excel sites. Yeah. Yeah. So I got, uh, I picked up one of those and I slid it in and it's pretty good. So nice. I'm going to go with that this year. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I thought about it long and hard because I also didn't know it was going to be available. And there does seem to be quite a few of those five pin fixed floating around for the Matthews. Yeah. And I was, if I was in that situation, I was going to do exactly what you said. I've never shot an animal over 70. Ooh, no. So 30 to, and, and I think you're so close at 30 if you, you could literally just put the pin, what are you going to be two inches oh, high? I, I Something do. like I, that I've at shot, 20? Yeah. Who cares? I've shot animals at 10 yards. I've always, I've always run my first pin at 30 and I yeah. just, it doesn't make any difference. Like I can shoot even on a target. I can shoot like I'm hitting. It's, it's a couple inches and on an animal, it doesn't make any difference. So, no. but it's just nice. I like having that extra 70 pin. It's yeah. uh, like a typical shot is realistically is going to be like 40 to 60. You know what I mean? Yep. For like, the hunts I do, the hunts you do is like, that's hundred percent. All my experience, it's been 40 to 60. It's not, 90% gonna, of the stuff yeah. I've shot has been 40 to 60. Like a, a couple bears at 30. My elk was at 30, but lots. I like 40 to 60. I don't think that's a, pe- something people talk about enough. They're trying to get close shots. I feel way more comfy at 40 to 20 yeah. because shit starts going off the rails at 20. Like who knows? Either they're going to see you, smell you. They're right on top of you at 20. I would way rather... He's at 40, everything's quiet, doesn't know I'm sitting in it, just like way less stress sitting at oh, that yeah. 40 to 60, in my opinion. Yeah, man, you have a, you have absolutely, it's when you're 20, yeah. it's freaking, you're, it's nerve wracking. Like you, if you're not already, if you don't have, if you're not already knocked on your D loop, then anything within 20, like you're, you're busted, especially if you're whitetail hunting. Yep. 100%. Like, yeah, I've gotten. Yeah, I don't have a ton of whitetail. That was my first experience. Um, I mean, I've done coos. I guess that's technically a whitetail, but I haven't done my. This was my first kind of tree stand uh, archery whitetail hunting this year. Um, but I would assume I, I was blown away how sketchy those things were. Yeah, I fuck. I have a hard time in tree stand, man. Super. I hard thought time. I was going to too, but I kind of got into it, man. I'm kind of a glutton for punishment, and I, I just liked yeah. the. Uh, it was also pretty cushy, like they're permanent tree stands and oh, some of them are, are pretty nice. big. So it's like, I could see if I, I, I know like the light ones that people are running and gunning with, like that would be a different, I'd have probably have a hard time sitting still in one of those for a few hours too. Yeah. I do a lot of branch sitting. So I'll climb up, just sit on a branch. And just No shit. Yeah. But it's That's, tough. It's, uh, have you tried the saddles? No, I thought about it, but I don't know. I just, it, I kind of like, I'm so like up last minute type of thing. So it's like, I, I don't know what I'm yeah, yeah. really doing till I'm like 
in the bush and like i changed my mind so fucking much i'm brutal it, once i'm there and i'm set up i'm fine but like until i'm actually there set up i don't really know what i'm doing right like right. i like when whitetail hunting i usually start scouting for whitetails in october so i'll have okay. an idea where the bucks i want to target are, and i usually have like a couple spots where of which ones i want to do and so it all depends on like my trail cam reads you know getting close to it and like i really don't really start hunting whitetails till december 1st so yeah okay i like when the bush is quieted down you don't have a bunch of people running around those bucks they're a little more you know they're a little more comfortable showing their face walking around it's getting closer to the rut i just find it a lot easier and like i'm i'm gonna bow hunt anyway so it makes no difference to me it's just you gotta that's the whole point you're supposed we're we're supposed to get a benefit for hunting with the bow and in bc we don't really, with the one exception of that late season whitetail hunt. Yeah. So yeah, man, I think that's, I'm all over that. Yeah. And last year I was cutting it pretty close. I had a really nice one on my trail cam picks and oh, yeah. it was cutting down to the, I got mine on the 18th, but I wow. sat the, yeah, I was pushing it down to the wire and I was like, fuck. And I was waiting, passed up on a couple and same thing. I was like, oh, because I had a bad experience with an elk at the beginning of the year on September 2nd. I passed on a six by five only because on the two days before it opened, I seen a really nice six by six. I probably scored three sixty. Oh, geez. So, um, yeah, it, uh, that's the only way you're going to kill the big guys, man, is by passing them. That's, that's hard to do. So I commend you for that, man. There's not a lot of people who like that, that takes discipline. Yeah. Yeah. But it was good. I got, I got, uh, I got a pretty nice buck and ended up being a lot bigger than I thought once I got close to him, but yeah it's fun man it's kind of funny i don't really get like right now i'm like eh, whatever not really into whitetail hunting but then like yeah by the end of november i don't know if it's just too like because everything's already over and you kind of know that that's really all you got left and you don't want to give up yet like yeah you're just like okay i want to you know so i don't mind passing on deer on like for the first 10 days of december but after you know after once it gets start gets a little closer to that 20th it's like okay uh maybe i I gotta have to yeah from the 15th on it i'm gonna have to send send an arrow here i don't know but yeah now do you find the action drops off pretty steeply at some point or are they pretty active all the way to the 20th as far as rut activity goes man it it seems like it all depends on the year you know like (laughs) yeah fair enough like if it's if we get a really harsh cold snap like the beginning of december and then it warms up a bit I feel like it's it's it it's actually pretty good. Okay. But then if we get like if it's warm and then all of a sudden we get like a real harsh ass cold snap, which sometimes we do, then it's tough. Now, having said that, that could just be me, right? Because like when it's freaking right. cold and miserable, it's a lot harder for me to sit there and wait for deer. Absolutely. So that could totally just be me. But yep. um, yeah. Yeah. What about your uh, arrow setup? Okay. So this is funny. I just ordered all my shit today um to build my new arrow and to be honest it's kind of a clone of my old arrow with everything just a little bit lighter to compensate for dropping down 10 pounds so and i and I, I recognize i might i might need to test a couple things out i recently picked up an arrow saw and a chronograph so that's one of the things i'm gonna do is is take some shots and like figure some stuff out so don't, the following is not written in stone. I might change it up a little bit, but based on my last setup, and it's a pretty, like, I'm, it's nothing too crazy. Like, it's pretty standard for what people would shoot these days. So I'm going to go uh, Black Eagle Rampage 300s with a four fletch AAE hybrid 2.7 inch veins. Just put a wrap on there because I like it for practicality. Easton Genox seem to fit really well on my serving. And then Iron Will solid 125s up front. And then a 15 grain insert and a 10 grain collar, which should get my entire, you know, depending on where I'm at between like 30 and 31 inches, my whole arrow should be 480 grains total. Right. Hmm. Huh. Thoughts. That's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I'm shooting a, like just over five this year. Last year I was shooting heavy. Yeah. But I, uh, see, my, 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 my last arrow was about six, 600 
on on my yeah. code of yeah, fire. I was, like I was, I was really pushing the heavy arrow. Yeah. Oh, well, I was high B front end. I had a high FOC. Um, what I, uh, what was your what was your setup? Last year I was shooting full metal jackets. Okay. I had a hundred grain insert, one twenty five yep. inch, and I last year I switched to the tripan, the mechanical. Okay. Yeah, which I actually really liked them, loved them. Yeah. And I was hesitant on that because I've always just shot fixed blade. Fixed, fixed blade? Fixed. Yeah. And I like, have that's what the, I was told. Uh, well, and uh, li- li- listen, I started with mechanicals because I didn't know how to tune my bow. And now every time I see somebody with mechanicals, I always in the back of my mind, I'm like, that's just because you don't know how to get a, a fixed blade to line up with your field point. And that, so that's why I shot them. But I also think people are, are writing them off unnecessarily. Like there's a lot of studs. And I think if you're going to take a couple longer pokes, like I know a couple guys who walk around with both in the quiver. And I think that's a great idea. I picked up when I was running mechanicals, I was running the rage, um, hypo plus P's. So oh, they, yeah. they're 125 grain. And, you know, I'm doing some hunts like caribou, it, it, you know, assuming we get a caribou season in, in sticks, and I might stick a couple of those in the quiver, man. If I see yeah. a caribou at 70 or 80, fuck it. Let's oh, take yeah. a poke. I mean, if they don't know I'm there, and I would trust that rage out. Because I don't know. I think fixed blades are good to about 60, and then you're just going to get more drop off than, than a field point. I, that, and that's just physics. There's nothing you can mm-hmm. do about that. You know what I mean? So, I, And I, I think a lot of the things people used to complain about with mechanicals, with manufacturing technologies come the way they have, I think it's a totally suitable option now if you know what you're doing. Yeah, I, I, I haven't had, I've had clear pass through both lungs, rib cage, like shoulders in and out, like last year. Especially a heavy arrow, because this is the other thing. People are, are, are apples to oranges because they're like, oh, a heavy arrow with a fixed blade, or you have these white tail guys who are shooting like 350 grain arrows with a mechanical, and it's like, well, yeah, of course they're having penetration issues. They don't have enough weight yeah. to push that arrow through. But if you're shooting a 450 plus grain arrow with a mechanical out of a 70 pound bow, I mean, you're going to get that penetration, but I do believe you need the heavier arrow, it, especially with a mechanical or a lot of weight up front. Like you got to, you, you got to have a heavy setup in order to yeah, get that momentum I, up. I always like, uh, I like a heavy front end now. And I actually just switched my arrow up a bit. I, I wanted a little bit more weight. I, I felt like I was kind of underweight. So I, I lengthened my arrow a little bit, uh, but okay. then I also, then I went, I was shooting four. I had four veins on and then I switched it over back to three. Okay. So I was shooting the max hunter. Yeah. So I shot so that's a slightly year. higher profile, right? Yeah. Than yeah. the max stealth, a little shorter, a little taller. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I never shot those max stealths. Like, and I, you know, I like four, I like four fletched arrows. I just, you know why I like four? Because I don't have to think about it when I put it on my fucking bow. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm, I'm not kidding. Like, <laughs> I, I, I think there's an argument to be made. Sometimes I'm thinking, you know, and I've got that Arizona easy fletch, and it's so easy to fletch three arrows, and you get wicked helical out of that thing. Like, it's a beautiful looking and behaving arrow. Yeah. But then in a stressful situation, I'm always looking for my cock vein. And oh, yeah. with a four fletch, I don't, I just put it on and go to town. And I got to admit, it sounds kind of stupid, but that's like the tipping point. Why I go with, why I go with four instead of three. But I think oh, four yeah. was all the rage. And I see lots of people going back to three now. Well, I mean, like, especially because you don't have a fixed blade, so you don't need the steering. Yeah. Well, that's just it. And like four is great. Like off the string, I was just finding with those bigger profile with four, I just like the longer ranges. I just wasn't getting reaction down range as I was as good as reaction as I was with the three, like the blazer veins. They're just yeah. hard to argue with. Like they're just, yeah, I don't know. They're just, they're good. So I went back to that, but like regarding, I'm just so used to my knock index. I just, let's like, I, I won't even, Fair. I just grab it. And as soon as I knock and I know where it is on my thumb. And if I'm, as I'm sliding, sliding it down, I'll spin it. But I'm just, I've gotten so used to just, just having that feel in my hand that, and like, yeah, it, man, it could be minus 20 and I don't wear gloves. So I did. Right. Yeah. But my hands are kind of numb from all those years of commercial fishing. So <laughs> I don't mind the cold, <laughs> except no like my body, my core gets cold. It drives me nuts. Yeah. The cold's a tough one, man. Yeah. It sucks. 
It really does. Especially suck. here, because if it's cold, it's uncomfortable. It's not. Well, like- I'm a like I was. I grew up on the coast, like North Coast, and it's all cold on the coast. It's a lot fucking different than cold inland here, where I am now in Region Eight. You know, Kelowna. Yeah. So yeah, it's that's uh, true. It goes right through you that cold, that coastal cold. Cold. Well, that's what most of my forestry experience is. Is all coastal layout. Um, so same thing. I was used to ten hours a day in that shit, man. In Helly Hansen rain gear and a cruising vest. So where were you? Just, where did you guys work out of? So I've worked uh, through the majority of the province. So when I first, <clears throat> my whole background was in tree planting. I did tree planting throughout university, and then when I when I was done university, I just wanted to go live in the bush. So I came out to BC. I'd been here every summer planting, and I just started planting full time. And a lot of it happened on the island, a lot of my tree planting, because it was like better money. We were doing the inlets. I was at the Butte, night inlet, doing yeah. like boat work and, you know, heli work, brushing, spraying, planting, just doing whatever. And then taught snowboarding in Mount Washington one year. And then I actually went to Australia for two years and I ran a tree <laughs> planting company over there and that was just a shit show of a two years bro like just it's a blur i don't even really remember what happened but we planted a lot of trees and partied a lot i remember saying to one of my guys i'm like fuck man we party like rock stars and he's like no we party like drug addicts i'm like yeah i mean there's an argument i'm not gonna (laughs) yeah yeah fair fair um and then when I came home, after helping my mom's company out a bit, I basically just talked my way into an engineering position on the island. And it was out of a place, do you know the North Island at all? Yeah. Like it, as a place called Holberg. Right, yeah. So you go to Hardy, take a left yeah. on a gravel road, and go for 45 minutes, and you're kind of falling mm-hmm. off the back of the island. And I worked there 10 and 4s for a while. And that was like pretty gnarly winter work, like crazy winds, crazy storms, super cold, super wet. But I don't know, man, there's something about working in the bush too. I think you probably, I've never done time on boats, but you can kind of get a weird comfort in it. And I'm assuming you can probably do the same thing in boats. Like when you're all done up in your gear and you just kind of go to this place where it's like, fuck, it doesn't really matter what it's doing. You just do your job, man. And I find that helped me a lot with hunting too, because I don't, I just hate having, I got to have something on my head. I can't fucking stand rain on the bare top of my head. But as long as I got some kind of like hat or hood pulled up, I don't really give a shit what it's, what it's doing. But anyways, worked out of there for quite a while. And then in 2008, the housing crisis hit and they shut down most of the operations on the island. I moved to Quinnell, worked out of Quinnell for a while. That was cold as shit. A lot of sled work. But like you could be, uh, I, I can remember going to work all day at minus 20 in like a Stanny and a cruising vest. Yeah. And you just don't stop moving, you know? Even, I'd stand while I eat my lunch and you're on snowshoes and you're in Beetle Woods. So you're like, I'm probably doing, you know, 10, 15 miles a day at least. And you're just walking all day. So mm-hmm. you don't really, and it's that much drier cold up in Quinnell too. Like that was a, probably a pretty pleasant winter compared to Holberg. And then... After like doing a bunch of other shit for a little while, I got hired by a company called Infinity Pacific and their office was based in Abbotsford, but we did work all over the place. And I ended up running operations on Haida Gwaii for two years and did 10 and fours under Haida Gwaii for two years. So I'd fly out of the South Terminal uh, Monday morning, I had to go up to Massett and then I'd drive into camp. I worked for 10 days and I'd come home Thursday, did that for two years and then moved back to the office in Abbotsford ran Squamish for a while, did some Fort St. John stuff. Yeah, bounced around all over the province, but most of my home bases have been lower mainland and then travel, do 10 and fours, you know, a variety of other places. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that's, yeah, I mean, fishing, it's kind of the same shit, right? I mean, it's all the yeah. same logging, fishing, it's all the same stuff. So you were up, up north there, you lived on, what did you think of st- staying on the Charlottes there? It was fucking, I mean, it was great, dude. You can kill yeah. 15 deer a year. <laughs> it's like, nuts, eh? It was crazy. <laughs> and it was like, that's where I really started getting back into hunting. And it was a perfect place because like you can fuck up and you can fool around. You know what I mean? Like there's no pressure. Like it was to the point there for a while where you just kept your gun in your work truck. And like, if we see something driving around, you just shoot. I remember shooting deer 
uh, gutting it, throwing it over a bridge because the the creek would be like cool air, and um, and just hanging the deer over the bridge for the day, and then picking them up on the way home from work. Yeah, like it was it was pretty chill, and I got to do some elk hunting on the island. I never. I never, I never took one, but I've got some crazy elk from Haida Gwaii on trail camera. I have this seven by eight that is unreal, Yeah, which is now dead. And, it, and somebody sent me a, a picture of the rack, which was kind of heartbreaking. Um, there's, there's some big elk out there. Big. Real big. But it's, man, I'm going to be honest. It's shit elk hunting. Like, yeah. There's only two real areas where they are. And if anybody's ever been to the Charlottes, they know where these areas are like there. And there's not a lot of elk there, but it's flat. It's tight. It's, I, I don't find they're overly vocal elk on, on the Island. Like sure. They'll, they'll bugle just like every other elk will bugle, but different areas. I find elk behave a little bit differently. And I don't think they're super vocal on, on those islands. Um, but yeah, man, got to do a lot of good hunting, got to do a lot of good fishing. The work was, you know, whatever it's layout. It's shit when you're doing it. Cause you're just humping around in the, but that's the other reason why like, and people don't get that. Like, well, that's why backcountry hunting came so easily to me. Like my job was to get out of a truck and just go into the mountains all day. There's no trails. There's no fucking nothing. You don't have any maps. Like your job is to make the map, like go yeah. find the shit, you know, go build, you go lay out roads, go find timber, go map creeks, go draw a picture of this whole mountainside so that we can come in and get the timber. And then, so after doing that for so many years, when I found backcountry hunting, I'm like, well, this is just, this is fucking easy. I just got to do the same thing. Only I get to like plan it first and get on Google earth. And like, yeah, it really came naturally to me because of all of all of that experience yeah that definitely helps for sure when you already 100%. have all that like that's because that's the hardest part well and i started when we had no gps and this is the thing i'm trying to tell all the kids these days like we literally i would have a string box and a compass so um and for anybody listening who doesn't know what a string box is it's also called a hip chain and it's basically this little plastic box with this super fine almost dental floss like string and it comes two kilometer rolls and you basically tie it to a twig and you just start walking and the thing unrolls behind you. And that when you take a bearing and you walk and then you get 150 meters or however far you're going and you look down and this box will tell you how far you've walked. And you're literally constantly plotting on a map exactly where you are. And that was the other thing that I think, like I, I notice a lot of people get scared in the woods and after being in the woods for years with no GPS going to the being in the woods with GPS. I also find that's like a bit of a cheat code. Like it's almost takes away. I would happily go pre back to pre GPS. Cause I think I had a better competitive advantage. Yeah. Like I think there'd be a lot of places I could get to that most people couldn't. And now with Onyx and a phone, I mean, it's, it's oh, wide it's open. Changed. It's insane. everybody goes everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I, I still like paper maps. I, I, yeah. Like I have, uh, I have, well, I used to have spot messenger and then now I have the Garmin, but I only have that just cause my wife makes me take it. So, which, you know, it's good too, because if, if she it's hit good. the fan here yeah. at home uh, and I needed to come out right away, I would hate to, you know, be two days into a 10 day hunt and then find out something happened and I was eight days too late. You know what I mean? So. Oh, hundred percent, man. And it's affordable, you know, yeah. back in the sat phone days, that was all we had. And it's like, you're like. We'd be hard, none of us would have those as hunters. Like they cost a thousand bucks. The minutes were well over a buck a minute and you had to buy these exorbitant plans. And so I do think, I think it probably gives us more freedom because the wives are yeah. a little more likely to like, let us go because if something does go wrong, which we know it's not going to, but I think they just want it just in case. Yeah. They just need that security. It's just women. hundred percent, man. Yeah. And well, and I always, I always take the piss out of my wife. Cause like she doesn't even fucking text back, man. Yeah. Like yeah. after day three, when I do like a check-in at night, like back at camp, everything's good. Crickets. Like yeah. I won't even get a like, okay, <laughs> have a good night. And I'm like, bitch, I'm in the fucking middle of the mountains. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not just I'm like, I'm alone. I'm kind of scared. Like you could at least say hi. Like what the fuck? But no, I she need doesn't someone give to talk a to. shit. 
Yeah. No, they no. actually like them. Like my wife likes it. Like yeah. she doesn't like now she's comfortable with it. Right. And the kids are a little old, like our kids are a little older. So she's, she's pretty chill with it. So I think she, but she kind of needs that vacation for me too. Eh? Cause like uh, the thing about I me is right. if I don't, if I don't get away and get out, I get pretty fucking miserable, man. And like, Dude, I couldn't, like I couldn't 100%. live with myself. I would be going no. at it straight time. Like there'd yeah. be holes in every wall. Cause we'd yeah. just be people going through it. If I had to live with myself. Yeah, it's wild how much easier it's got to go away. Like, dude, I probably do like on an average year, like four to five decent trips. This year will be a little bit different with the bodybuilding chokes. It's kind of nuke my spring, but typically I, I go away for four or five and like three of those will be for a, a week. One of them will be for two weeks. And then I'll maybe have like a three, four day quickie somewhere in there. But like I talk to my friends and they're like, what, the, how did you get your wife to like let you go away that much i'm like i don't know and i think it's probably because i'm a nicer guy when i get home and she's like yeah, yeah. This, is, this is better for both of us if you that, just do these that's trips. the key that that's the key that fellas need to do they just need to get so bitchy and whiny and then like <laughs> let, let it like wind up and just get yeah, really yeah. ornery bitchy bitchy and then go out <laughs> go out for a good hunt yeah and now whether it's a good hunt or shit shit hunt come home and even if you're pissed yeah. off fucking suck it up and just be like super nice and just let it yeah. right out for a month and then let the clock start to wind up again and just get real bitchy real moody and then she just then eventually she's gonna be like would you fucking go hunting just get out of yeah. here see and that's what i fucked up for the first few years like i was so goal focused i would come home and i was an asshole if i didn't get oh, like it yeah. took me five years and seven hunts to get my first elk and I don't deal with failure well. Like I'm a pretty disciplined guy and coming home in that truck every year, empty handed, like, and I would just be an asshole for a couple weeks, man, after I got home. And finally she was just like, listen, man, get your shit together. Like, I'm not going through this bullshit of like sitting here with this kid by myself for two weeks. So you can come home and be a piece of shit. Yeah. And that's what I Fair like. Enough. And then, then you're right. The way you said it, then it's like, I get my mind right on that drive home. And it's like, whatever happened out on the mountains, it has nothing to do with them. And they need me to come back at a hundred percent, like engaged, mm -hmm. present, you know, playing with the kid phone goes away. And so that's, I really focus on that now. And I think that's a really good insight you bring up. Like you've got to come home and be right back into it. And sometimes it's tough, man, because you got that mountain brain going on and it's like you, you don't really want to talk to people and you still mm -hmm. kind of like settling back into things but you don't really have that luxury if you no. want to, to keep them happy you got to come home and and hit the ground running yeah you got to just come home and just lock it down and then yeah yeah and just let it build up and then eventually you should just be like just fucking go hunting just get yeah, out of here get out of go here hunting, go hunting yeah 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 did who did you did you do all those elk hunts solo you go with someone? I've done I done a combination of a bunch. So the three that I did on uh, Haida Gwaii, I did with a buddy of mine who I worked with. Those are there. pretty fucking hard elk hunts, like to consider. Yeah. If you're coming out, like, I wouldn't consider that being like. I don't know if you can count those as part of. <laughs> Fuck, those are no, it's gnarly. fair. It's fair. They are. They are pretty gnarly. Um, yeah, three of those were with a buddy. And then I went to, um, where did I go next? Then I took my old man up the Musqua in 2017 on a jet boat and we didn't see shit. Well, that's not true. We saw one cow and we watched her get ripped apart by three wolves. <laughs> um, so my old man was like, this is fucking like Nat Geo type shit. And I'm like, yeah, you don't see this in Ontario, bro. <laughs> um, so he was fine. Even though we didn't see any elk, like he went home, was just like mind fucking blown. Um, yeah, shit, shit elk hunt there. Then I went to Wyoming with a buddy. We did a backcountry thing for 10 days. And then I went to, I'm trying to think what happened. There might have been another BC one in there. And I might have went to, oh, then I went to Montana guided and I just told this story on my podcast the other day, but I threatened to throw a guide off a cliff <laughs> because I found out on day five, he'd been running us into the ground so he couldn't, so he didn't have to take us to his honey hole. Oh, I, fuck I, was, off. Like, oh, I swear to God, I swear to God. I'm like, motherfucker, you're about to go off this mountain. 
because he saw us taking all these points on Onyx and he thought we were going to take his spot. And I'm like, cocksucker, you haven't even showed me a map since I got here. I'm taking points on Onyx because if you die, I need to know how to get back to the truck. Um, oh yeah, we got, like when I lose it, I lose it and I lost I it on this kid. Like hardcore. Um, and you're a we big mofo too. Made, uh, I wouldn't be fucking. He, yeah, he was. He got one of those white face. Like he was just like, <laughs> oh my god. And this guy who I just met from Washington that they paired up uh, together. He's like, bro, bro, calm down. I'm like, all right, all right. Anyways, anyways, that was terrible. I went to my, yeah, went to Montana, did a guided elk hunt, and then I think the next year I drew the tag in New Mexico, and that was the one. Yeah, solo, 36-hour drive, and killed my bull my bull at 10,000 feet in the White Mountain Wilderness, public land, by myself on day five. And that was like, I had a little mini breakdown up there after that, man. Because when you're working on something like that for, for so long, and then it finally, and you're sitting there looking at your bull, it's just, yeah, it's pretty intense. Yeah, I was pretty lucky. I had a good mentor, so it made it a lot easier. <laughs> I fucked up, man. I didn't fuck up, but like, I'm not good with people. Like I, like I wish if there was something I wished it's that I was better at like meeting people and wanting to hang out. And like, because I, I do, somebody asked me the other day, who was I talking to that elk shape, Dan Staten. I had oh, yeah. a Dano. podcast Dano. and love uh, Dano. He's what, hilarious. What a good guy, man. And yeah, he's a beauty. He, He's the one who asked me, he's like, okay, what did you, if you were going to give yourself feedback, what did you do wrong? Why did it take seven hunts in five years? And at first I didn't clue in. I'm like, I don't know, man. I think that was just what had to happen. And then like five minutes later it hit me and I'm like, no, I fucked up because I didn't get a good mentor. And I think they're out there and I have a couple kind of now, but even still they're not like somebody actively who go, and I still have a shitload to learn a ton of, learn. like I've really been really, really focused back on hunting for like five years, man. I'm, I, I'm still a fucking kid compared to like the legitimate fucking studs. Mm -hmm. Um, but I get this thing in my head where I feel like if somebody else helps me, I didn't really do it. And I think that's just bullshit ego. So yeah, yeah I said to Dan, I, I, I fucked up. I let my ego get in the way and I had this picture of how I was going to do it. And I didn't, that was the only way. And it was going to be, you know, public land. It was going to, I was going to, you know, it had to be archery and I had to call it in and I was going to do it myself. And like the storybook, a hundred percent, man, which people do. Cause, and this is where social media kind of screws us. Cause that's the story you see, but you don't see, like you look at guys like Lampers and you look at guys like Dan who are going out there and doing that. It's like, fine. Yeah. They're not showing the 10 years that it took for them to get to the point and that where they were going hunting with other dudes. And they probably only got an elk every three or four years because there was three or four guys hunting every year and everybody was taking their turn. Or they were going with an uncle and just learning, like none of that stuff. And that's the stuff that I didn't give myself permission. Like if I was going to do it all over again, I'd go look for some dudes that'd be like, can I just come on the hunt, man? Yeah. I don't, I don't need to kill nothing. I just want to hang out and see just show me how we get into elk country and show me how we call. I'll just, I'll, I'll help you pack meat or I'll, I'll help out at camp. I give you my word. I, I won't take your spot. Maybe even cause I can film and photograph. I would offer like, let me come along and I'll, I'll film you guys. You know, I can do up yeah. a little film at the end of the hunt and I don't got to kill nothing. And if I was going to do it all over again, that's what I would do. And I would do that for two or three years, hopefully with like the same dudes who like really know what they're doing. And then, then I, if I wanted to, you know, I felt like I had to go off and kind of, you know, go on my vision quest and do my thing myself, at least then I would be, I would have been more like realistically prepared for what it was I was about to do. Yeah. See, I, I, that's the thing is like, I was super lucky. I had a cousin, older cousin, seven years older with me. And like, when we went and started going elk hunting, he like didn't even bring a gun. He just brought his calls. Right. Okay. So he's just like, no, he's like, I'm going to, we just went like, but he's, he's always been like that with me and like, not so much anymore now with elk, especially, but just because I've killed more than him, but <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Now, yeah. Now, uh, now he's, you know, but like I said, I was, I was super fortunate to have a guy like that, but, uh, yeah, that's yeah. badass, man. That's how it should happen, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. 
yeah, I, which I is- want to focus more on, you know, I'm trying to take a couple of greenies bear hunting this year because that's another oh, nice. thing. Like I'm not into the great white hunter, but I know a little bit about a little bit now. And I think I can shave some, I'm a Absolutely. decent enough bear hunter and I think I can shave some learning curves for some dudes. And I, well, think it's, it's bush skill too, dude. You know what I yeah. mean? Like it's, you could spend as much time as you want hunting, whatever. There's a little bit of luck involved in everything. So hundred percent. And it's mental too. Like if you, if you've got good bush skills, you're going to be on day three, you're not going to get freaked out and want to yeah. go home or be thinking about just trying to get shoot anything you can because you want to go home you got those calluses built up already and i think that's a huge thing i think the biggest obstacle for new hunters is just getting over the fear of getting out like that's the number one dude obstacle. you're nailing it man and I, I i say it all the time on the podcast it's like everybody keeps hitting me up for the perfect boots and the perfect tent and it's like it's not your boots or your tent that's going to send you home it's your fucking mind yeah for sure and the only way you can toughen it up is by more time out there like i gave up on hunts I remember coming out of the back country because it was, I still had three or four days left, but I just, I, for whatever, if it was, if it was weather, if it was not seeing enough animals, but there was a couple hunts at the beginning and I can remember driving home and, and having to admit to myself, you fucking broke, you broke, you came out when there's no good reason to come out. And now you're going home one or two days earlier, whatever it right. is. And I think you need those. And then because then you're in there the next year and you like the whole lead up, it's like that shit ain't happening. I don't care if I don't see a fucking thing. Maybe the win is just not like, I'll, I'll be honest, man. My first goat hunt there that I did solo last year, part of the win for me was like, you're not, no matter what happens in there, you're not coming out until the last day. And I think as a newer hunter, sometimes that's the win. Like just going in and staying the whole hunt. Like, don't be an idiot. Maybe bounce around areas. I'm not saying like, if you're not seeing shit, definitely don't feel like you can't move around a little bit, but your brain will come up with so many excuses that seem like rational ideas at the time for why oh, you need to yeah. leave. Yeah. And it's not until you get home that you're like every, fuck man, every single one of them was bullshit. Yeah. Oh yeah. You just totally manifest these things. Yeah. Like I get it. Like, Sure, I did it too. I mean, um, getting into like backpack hunting and stuff like that, I always kind of had someone. So it was never really, it wasn't till a little after, like I've already got accustomed to that, that I started going about doing solo. And then, then I started right. really like doing solo stuff just because I got to, when like when you're hunting with somebody else, you're like, oh, well, what should we go over here? Or should we do this? Should we do that? Like, yeah. I like to just be able to get up and just go. Like, I don't have to think. I'll be like, man, no this- compromise, man. Yeah. What do I want to do? I'm like that. That's it in a nutshell. Why I like hunting solo. Cause yeah, it sounds like a dickhead thing to say, but I never have to worry about somebody else's opinion. No, fuck no. And I, I like, yeah. I'm kind of selfish too. I always like shooting shit. So <laughs> uh, that's the other reason, man. Like, I was like, there's, there's no whose day is it to shoot when you're in there by yourself. But I wonder too, like, I think that it has definitely held me back. Like, I think I would have been better off sometimes. I probably over the course of the last few years would have got more action in total if I'd gone out with guys more because I think maybe I would have had the chance to learn more. I think where you're at. Like I wouldn't advise people to go straight to the solo thing because I think no. you're actually making your learning curve a lot longer than it needs to be. And I, I also think you don't have to kill shit to learn. Being around people who are killing shit is kind of more important than killing shit almost. Because some of the first shit I killed was just by accident. Like it wasn't because I did anything particularly brilliant. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, and dude, it happens. Like it happens still. You know what I mean? Like right. it. Yeah. Yeah. It happens still. I punch a lot of tags every year and. Like even this year you get lucky. So it's, yeah, it's all part of it. It's hunting, but yeah, like, but like I like hunting with, with buddies too. It's fun. Like, and it's funny because like yeah. you learn a lot of shit from people fucking up. Right. I was hunting with a buddy totally. this year and, and we were going for late season muleys. I already had a muley tag punch, so mm-hmm. I couldn't hunt, but just going with him and like just watching it. And he's like, he's asked me some questions and then, you know, I tell him what I think and he's like, okay, well, fuck you. I'm going to do this. And I'd be like, and then he'd go and try it and like totally not work. And I'd be like, okay, well, there you go. Note to self. That does not work. Yeah. <laughs> Proofs in that's, the pudding right there. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. So, but yeah, it's fun. It's good to get out. But like, now I got my boy, he just turned 10. So oh, pretty that's pumped on that. see my girl's six and she keeps asking to go. So that's the other thing I'm waiting for. Cause I'll. I know as soon as she's able to go, even as selfish as I am, I'm going to be more concerned about 
Oh yeah. Taking her out. It changes totally, man. But even like my youngest is six and he's already asking, like, he's like, dad, let's go do a goat hunt. I'm like, what? (laughs) A goat? Okay. Saddle up, buddy. (laughs) So going in hard right from the, right from the get go. My dad, he wasn't a backpack hunter at all. He was a moose hunter, but a truck hunter. Yep. But I mean, things were different then, man. Like that. Yeah. I think the access was a little bit different. I think the pressure was a little bit different. Yeah. And there, yeah. And I'm not think, saying they had it any easier. Like they were, those are still tough hunts, but I do think it was a different. Oh yeah. It was 35 it was years ago. So totally and there's still dudes like, man, all those guys like in Fort St. James and or uh, Fort St. John and, and Fort Nelson who've had like family camps for 20 years. And I still know people who go up like six or seven dudes, a jet boat, two quads, big trailer with a toy yeah. hauler. And it's like a fucking three ring circus, but they kill shit. Yeah, like they're coming home with like two caribou, a moose, and two elk, or whatever yeah. between like the whole camp. Like those those big camp kind of shows. If you know, like I still don't. I dude, I've hunted that corner of the province so many times now, and it just kicks my ass every time. And then you see these other dudes, and it's like, fuck, man, where are you going that I'm not going? But I think BC is just like that, man. Like there is definitely animals here, but I think it takes a long time to oh. really figure different areas of the province out. And I think the dudes with the history and the family camps and that kind of stuff, like just hard to compete, man. And especially, you know, I think you need some gear, uh, you know, like some quads or some horses or some jet boats, like that really opens up a lot of this province. And I'm just used to backpack hunting. And it's just, there's a lot of this province that does not lean itself to backpack hunting. If you want to really be like, look at how those, you know those BC backcountry guys um, out of Kamloops, Jordan and uh, Ryan? They kill elk every single year, and they don't backpack hunt. They go in with a big trailer, a couple quads, and they're day hunting, right? Like they go out and they do their big morning sprints, and then they do a big afternoon sprint. They go back to the trailer so they can dry out all their clothes, and it's like those guys have figured out a way to go kill elk every year, and it's not tromping around in the, in the hills for a week no. at a time with a, with a backpack on. They tried it. It's just yeah. not nearly as successful. Well, those guys, and they're just, they've been doing it for so long. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like my dad and his brothers and like his buddies, like they truck hunted for so long. And like, I, even like I, I go grouse hunting with my dad and it's amazing the shit he picks out or just like, even like the roads, he can tell on the roads if there's going to be grouse or not, like just from driving. Really? Yeah. And it's like, wow, the fuck? Like I need to, I, the shit, the thing is, I'm going to have to learn how to do that because I'm not going to be body's already beat to shit as it is. I'm only 43, yes. you know, yeah. and I'm still going to want to do this when I'm his age. 100%. He's just got it dialed in like that truck yeah. on. He's got it dialed in. Yeah. And those guys used to kill moose all the time. They never got other trucks ever. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, they might've went for a little walk here and there and checked at the end of a cut block, but they just had shit dialed in, man. They just knew what to look for, what weather, yeah. weather patterns to watch you know, just, I think timing too, like my family was once a year moose hunters back in Ontario and it was like Thanksgiving week, man. Nobody ever, like we go on so many different hunts to so many different places. Like there's no way you're going to be successful on every single one of those, especially if you're going to a bunch of new places. Oh yeah. But like for those dudes, it was like, they knew that 10 days that was like, this is the best 10 days. And this is the only 10 days we go. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And if you, that's the thing, if you're hunting as much as like guys like me and you, yeah, it, it's like, you're kind of not like if you're only going to go once, like if you're only going to go hunting once for the whole year, that fucking one time you go better count. Yeah. (laughs) Like you're not going to just be like, well, you know, it's, I'm going to go try here. Cause if that doesn't work, then in a week I'll go over here. Right. It's not, it's not like that. Like those guys knew where to go, when to go. They usually just took a week off work cause that's all they're allowed. And they just, they made shit happen. Like they got it done. Yeah didn't bounce around. And I think the camp mentality, like we've already commented, I think that helps success rates because you you just got so many more eyes out in the bush that, you know, and you're, there's still enough that everybody's going to be successful. But I think going out with, with five or six dudes who all know what they're doing, your odds are just so much higher, especially when you trust them, when it's the same dudes who are hunting together year in yeah and year out where we have gotten a little more individualistic and i think people have gotten a little bit more like i don't know maybe people are just shittier but like maybe too many oh, people have been burnt 
taking people to spots and then all of a sudden everybody and their brothers going to that spot. And I think, you know, dudes in your old man's generation are probably a little bit more integrity, a little bit more. Yeah. They had more class. Yeah. hundred percent, man, where it was like, you know, there's a right way to act and a wrong way to act. And, you know, I think we lost a little bit of that these days as well. Yeah. Like I know, I know like my wife's dad, he was a hard, he was a hardcore hunter, right? Like he shot everything okay. in his fucking province and like, Talk about tough. That guy did it in like jeans and like <laughs> fucking wool jacket. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like just hard, you know, Crazy. like never. Yeah. Just tough as nails. Right. And like, I remember asking him some questions about this stone sheep he shot. And he's like, yeah, I went with a, fr- a friend. Let me go along with him for that trip. And I was like, Oh, where was he? He's like over my dead fucking body. If you think I'm going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and still to this day, like who cares, man, you're old. Like, what the oh, yeah. Fuck? Yeah. 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 That's so, so funny, man. Yeah. But what's your what's your year you look like? Do you know what's going on yet for your plans? I think it's gonna depend on LEH draws, man. I don't know. Like Yeah, fair. I, I don't know. Like I'm hoping well, who's maybe even knows get... what's going on with some of the over counter tags that like yeah, half of my season thing. is really gonna depend what happens in six because of what's happening in seven B. Yeah, I don't know. And I wish they'd fucking tell us. And I know I'm the same way, man. Like yeah, it feels I get like a guillotine no... hanging over my head. I get no nothing from anybody since I made that one post on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude, that was, we haven't even talked about that. Like that was kind of let the cat out of the bag because everyone had said, no, they never asked for it to get taken away and blah, blah, blah. And then your post came out. I was like, wait a minute. That looks to me like that's a pretty clear cut ask. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, man. And the funny thing is when I, I got a lot of phone calls. Like I did that post. It's funny. I went to that thing Friday night, did yeah. that post Saturday night. Like, I yeah. don't know what time around dinner time, maybe after dinner, I was getting, my phone was getting lit up Sunday morning and it got lit oh. up Sunday. Monday was insane. <laughs> Tuesday was insane. And then finally by Wednesday, it started to die down, but apparently the, it made it to uh, the premier's office. So it ended up on. Were they desk. pissed that it had got out at that meeting and then had been leaked to social media? Yeah, fuck. I don't. Yeah, they, yeah. like I talked to Je- Jesse Zeman. He called me and he was talking to me about it. And he's like, "Yeah, well, if you wanted to make a splash, you did because you fucking pissed off a lot of people." And then he's like, "Well, we haven't had any conversation, so I can't comment." That's the thing is, like, it, right then everyone's tight lipped about everything, right? Yeah. Like nobody's yeah. gonna make a comment. So no, whatever. I mean, like, we still don't know. I mean, maybe that was false. Like all I did was repeat what I heard. So, but I just yeah. felt like it was something that. As if that's really what's going on, then the resident hunters need to know that shit. Yeah, I don't know, man. I still have a little bit of a hope that they might do something a little bit different or at least limit it to 7B and really stick to this two-year trial thing. Like, that was a lot of blowback. Like, I don't think... Like, that would have been on an order of magnitude more than when the Grizzly happened because nobody nobody was... organized or you know the the speed with which everybody got my only regret still is that we weren't able to penetrate like like mainstream media like it would have been nice but the problem is because it's a native issue you're fucked man because that's it doesn't matter how rational and logical your objections are all people hear is like you don't want natives to get what they deserve. And it's like, okay, can you just fucking chill out for a second? That's not what I said. Like yeah. I'm, I, I'm more than happy to like work for reconciliation. And yeah, if some people got fucked over, let's fix what's broken. I'm not saying that, but it's like, can we at least admit that maybe there's like good ways and bad ways to do this and maybe what's on the table right now isn't the best way but you just there's so much background noise because of the whole racist thing you can't in this day and age man you you're fucked oh, like you can't oh, exactly. have a conversation so about it fuck yeah you can't even talk about it without no. being called like no oh you're just like, a fucking racist you just don't want the natives and it's like what the fuck man whoa I didn't even, yeah and then you're like oh back the fuck up first of all i didn't even say anything that about anything at all all i'm asking yeah. is like hey can we look at this like can we how about we slow this down and we take a couple yeah. looks at this from all angles that's all i said yeah. the, they can do whatever they want but the yeah. shitty thing is the decision was already made by the end of february because the regs were already printed up i know so the regs and that are, comment period is horseshit like there it is. It, 
Yeah. And if you look at all the emails floating back and forth, like they're written in past tense. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like all the people at the ministry is like, no, this thing has happened. Yeah. We're giving you a chance to comment on it. But, and yeah. I think that's what people don't understand about this system is like this shit. It's like the grizzly thing. It didn't happen by fucking referendum. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Oh no. He just made the decision and executed. And that's well, all and, there is to it. Yeah. And it's, it's a reaction, not an action on our half. Like we, we don't even have a, chance to yes. do any action it's just a real like yeah. if they need to put those a year in advance saying hey these yes. are going to be the proposed these are going to be the proposed changes for the yep. next the next um cycle yes so the next time the regs come out these are going to be the proposed changes now you guys have this much time to comment we're going to take feedback on science based nothing else it doesn't fucking yep. matter if people don't like it they don't like the grizzly bear hunt they can fuck off it doesn't matter as long as the science can support it because like look at yep. the mess you have you hear from people up north oh it's crazy like it's yep. a fucking mess up there with the grizzly bears so oh, it's crazy well my black bear hunting spot is just dude like it's about an hour and a half outside of Prince George and it is just like littered with grizzly bears. Yeah. They're well, everywhere. Everywhere. And it's only going to like, we took a small percentage of them too, but it kept it and kept them in line. Like, you know what I mean? Like it kept well, them. Yeah. hundred percent, man. I feel like a dick, but I almost hope for maulings. Like, I, like I don't want people <laughs> to get hurt, but it's like, well, we, we, maybe we if we to... stack up enough dead hikers, people will finally be like, holy shit. But then we'll do something like California. So get this shit. I was listening to this the other day on a podcast. So back when lion hunting was legal in California, they would kill 300 to 400 lions per year. Now they Minor. made lion hunting illegal in California and they pay government hunters oh, to dude, kill three to 400 lions per year. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, so you're taking this thing that was a revenue generating activity. People were willing to give you money to go solve this problem for you. And you said, no, 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 we can't have that. Now you're going to go pay money to people to do the exact. And that's what I think that it's wouldn't surprise me if that's what happens with the Grizzly. If they, if they get, if they think they become too big of a nuisance, they'll pay professional hunters to go in and, and knock down the population or they'll do like a poison or an, or a trapping or a, what, however they, they choose to do it at, before they open the season back up. That's what I'm well, afraid will happen. Well, with the Grizzlies, it's a butterfly effect. Now Grizzlies rule the, they rule the forest. Besides yeah, humans going there and fucking nuking it, they rule the yeah. roost, right? So you're not going to find other predators where you're going to find, like the, the black bears aren't cruising around with the fucking grizzly bears. You know what I mean? Like there's a reason there's so many black bears pushed down low now and they're getting through everyone's yeah. garbage because the fucking grizzly bears pushed them out of their territory. They're like, get the fuck out of here. This is mine. I own this area, right? Yeah. And now every think of every year if you're not taking 300 grizzly bears out. So yeah. we've, that's what now, four years? So... I mean, yeah, those grizzly up. bears are having more grizzly bears and those grizzly bears are having more grizzly bears. Like it's just yeah. an exponential. Oh, and it just pushes right the mean. predators. It pushes the other predators just down and out of their yeah. zone because I mean, except for wolves, obviously wolves fuck with whoever they want, but yeah. Um, but I mean like the other things like cougars and, and the black bears, especially. And then like around here in the Okanagan, people are like, Oh, well, how come we're getting so many black bears in town? And then you go 20 kilometers off to, dirt road and you see a yeah. fucking grizzly bear and you're like and you never seen grizzly there bears there before and then people are like well i don't get it yeah it's because you're an idiot that's <laughs> yeah. the problem here can't help there's you. only so much room in the forest yeah dude it's been yeah, fun it's good to catch up yeah man i appreciate so what are you it. doing anyway you're, on. you're fucking you're an, you're an animal man so you're <laughs> you you were like a hunt to what you're six one you're big dude right yeah you're, so you're six one you're like yeah 200 something looking good you jacked up to a monster and now you're going yeah. back down now i'm going back down so here's how it went i was because I, I know because i just pulled all the pictures the other day so almost three years ago i was 209 six foot one 209 pretty shredded like by all accounts super fit dude um and then i decided i would wanted to do a, I know, and i know people don't get this but like I've wanted to do a bodybuilding competition since I was like in my twenties and not because of, of some fucking weird, like getting your underwear and get all oiled up. It's like, I knew kind of old school bodybuilders when I was growing up in the gym and like learning how to train. And like, everybody always talked about the suffering of a, of a prep. 
for a show, the cut, the kind of 16 weeks. And it was like, that was the part that was fascinating to me. It's the same reason I'm so fascinated with backcountry hunting. Like I love the suffering of it. I don't know. It's just very I get romantic it. to me. I, got a lo- I want to see what I'm capable of. I want to push myself until I yeah. break. I want to figure out what was weak. I want to kill that part. And then I want to come back and do it again. Right? So three years ago, you know, life's good. Got money, got stability, wife's good, kids good. I'm like, fuck it, I'm gonna do this. And so in two and a half years, I went from 210 to 271. Um, <laughs> yes, which is like, and I don't I don't recommend it, man. Like I did a couple hunts at 260 plus, and it was like the worst experiences of my life. I remember on that goat hunt, it was a 91 pound pack, and I was 260 pounds. So it was 350 pounds. I remember talking to MSR with snowshoes. I remember talking to MSR later. I'm like, your snowshoes broke, man. (laughs) And and they're like, fucking tank. They're not made for. Yeah, they're like, what do you what do you weigh? I'm like, "Uh," like 260. And they're like, how much is your pack? I'm like, "Eh, I don't know, 90 pounds. They're like, bro. And I'm like, I know, I know, I know. And it was so funny because we came to an agreement because at first there was like, no. The, and I'm like, listen, I'll send you the YouTube video. I filmed the whole fucking thing. I was, listen, I was responsible with these. And we came to an agreement that they would replace them if I never tried to warranty them again. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, deal, deal. And it was their fault because on the website for that particular line, the MSR Lightning Ascents, it just says 300 pounds plus. Oh. And what they need to do is just go like 300 flat because yeah. then they could have said, you know, go fuck yourself. But anyways... So I go all the way up to 270, knowing I can't live there. Like my knees are getting beat to shit. I can't backcountry hunt. And if somebody, if God came down from above and said, you can do one activity for the rest of your life, what's it going to be? Without a hesitation for me, it's backcountry hunting. So I knew I, the plan was never to live up at that weight. You got to get really big so that when you lose all the weight, you still have something. Like I don't want to step up there at six foot one, you look like a twig unless you got some like legitimate mass, right? So, so I go all the way up to 270 and then I started my prep back in January and kind of like the first eight weeks is like a, like an easy going prep. You just kind of clean up your diet, throw in a bit of cardio. Nothing gets too crazy. The PEDs kind of stay the same. Nothing. It's, it's like a little mellow. And so, and now I'm 13 weeks out from my competition and this morning I was 242 pounds. So I've lost 30 pounds since January. And I think I probably have another 30 to go. And I bet you I step on stage like inside out, fucking peeled, see my organs type of shit at 210. That would be, I would be very happy if that's what, which is funny because that's where I started three years ago was 209, but this will just be as long as everything works out a completely different 209. Different look, 209. Yeah. Like I'm not going to look like one of the pros or anything, but for an amateur. Chiselbod from now on. Jay (laughs) Chiselbod. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it was pretty funny, man. Some fucking, there was some pretty comical memes that went up the other day about it. And I was like, yeah, at least people are paying attention. Fuck. It. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, that's hardcore. I work out, I've, like, but I, I was playing hockey competitively. So I, I got into it then. And I just, I do it. Part of my routine is I get up at four and I work out every morning. Right. So, but nothing like that. That's fucking. Nuts. You're fucking Jocko Willink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool, dude. No, oh, fuck, yeah, man. man. It's been a good chat. I, Absolutely. Like, I w- wanted to have a drink, but then I knew you were on this crazy-ass diet, so I didn't even bring it up. Next time. Yeah. When you're done, when's Next your competition? Time. July 9th, out in Abbotsford. That'll be good. It'll be fun. No, thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. We'll um, we'll do round two on, on my show in a few weeks. Yeah, sounds good, buddy. Okay, man, you have a good night, eh? All right, you too, brother. Later. Again, everyone for tuning in to the focus hunting podcast it's coming at you as part of the waypoint outdoor collective quick shout out to the sponsors of the show vortex optics the best in optics period backroads maps books never get lost with backroads maps aku boots yo to your feet scree hunting gear now if you guys check the show notes you're going to find some promo codes use them save a bit love you guys talk to you soon